Today, while the lighting is good, well, <laughs> you know, to show glass, we're going to go over the history of this type of glass and what is it and all about the aesthetic movement. And all right, let us begin. Okay, so what you're seeing here is four pieces, and I'll get more, four pieces of Bohemian glass. And Bohemia was a place, it was actually called Bohemia, and it was a place that we know today as the Czech Repu uh, Republic. And these pieces were specifically made by a crystal company or glass maker by the name of Moser, M-O-S-E-R. Moser is absolutely beautiful. Now, Moser began in 1857 when Ludwig Moser, who was a talented engraver and businessman, opened an engravement, um, engraving workshop and store in a spa town, uh, Karlovy Vary. Mosa Crystal gained worldwide recognition thanks to its like unique beauty, quality, mastery, and timeless design. And uh, so these are antique pieces. Now, I believe they're still in business. But how I got started collecting Moser. Okay, so I knew nothing about glass. I still am no expert when it comes to glass. But um, look at this iridescent piece. Um, oh, my God beautifully i don't know it's very very hard to there we go very very hard to show you the detail on this but um so i knew nothing about this type of glass probably never even cared to even collect it until one day i went into an antique shop and it turns out that i have a booth there now and it never nothing in there ever sells the only thing that sells is ten dollar crystals believe it or not antiques do not sell in an antique shop it's insane but so i happened in there one day uh, before I went into work, I used to always like, I don't know, uh, about two, three hours before I had to go into work, I would just like do things because I didn't want to go into work. So I'd procrastinate. I'd be like, oh, I got to go into work. So I just so happens into this antique shop and on the counter was this gorgeous big box and it was like this color and it had all this enamel work on it and it said Vaseline glass jewelry box. $150. I knew nothing about it. And I was like, I have to have this box. Now, I thought Vaseline glass, which we know is depression glass, which was made probably in the early 20th century, around the time of the Great Depression, when things were made cheaply and mass produced. I was like, $150. Oof, that's a little steep. I don't know if I want to buy it. And then something told me, no, you have to buy this and you have to buy this box now. So I went up to the register and um, there was somebody running the antique shop and I went up to the man behind the counter and I said, I'd like to buy this box. And he said, well, the lady that, uh, handles the credit card transactions isn't here right now. So you're going to have to come back another time when she's here to buy it. Cause I can only pay for it by credit card. I didn't have cash on me. So I was like, shit, how am I going to get this box? So I said, I got to go into work. And what if I was like now worried? I was worried. I was like, what if somebody else finds this box and they buy it, right? And I don't get to buy it. <laughs> so I said to the guy, look, I'm a cashier. And that's what I was. I'm a cashier. I work at Petco. I know how to operate the credit card machine. And he's like, you do? I was like, yeah. So he, he pulled out this little miniature like credit card reader. And uh, I swiped my card. I pressed the, I, you know, I, I just knew how to operate it. And I pressed uh, the buttons. I hit enter. I hit receipt. I signed the receipt. I paid for the item. And I walked out with it. And so I get home and I'm like, what the hell is this? It doesn't really strike me as Vaseline glass. It looks too high quality. And then I found out it was a Moser glass casket box. And you're like, casket? That sounds a little nefarious. Well, a casket box back then used to have a lock and basically you would put sugar in there or some kind of precious uh, thing. Like at the time, uh, sometimes salt was a precious commodity, uh, sugar. You didn't want your servants to steal your sugar. Okay. So they made these locking casket boxes to put your things in. Also jewel caskets as well, but this was a sugar casket. And I was like, wait a minute, these things are selling for 1500 to $4,000. Are you shitting me? I just paid 150 bucks for it. Then I got the bug. I got the Moser bug, if you know what I mean. So like a schmuck, just for shits and giggles, okay, because I was new at this, right, with this type of glass, I put the casket box on Etsy. I had an Etsy shop at the time. This was years and years ago. And uh, some guy contacted me, and he's like, hey, uh, could you do me a favor? Could you tell me if a coffee can would fit inside that? That, that box. And I'm like, why is he asking me if a coffee can would fit inside that box? 
And uh, so I, I, I had a coffee can. I stuck it inside the box and it fit perfectly with ample room to spare. And I said to the guy, yeah, a coffee can. I showed him pictures of a coffee can sideways inside the casket. And he said, okay, I'm going to buy it. And I'm like, great. And I had a price tag of $1,850 on it. And I was like, what, what? Uh, somebody actually wants this thing for $1,850 after I paid $150 for it? By the way, I never told the antique shop, uh, the person that owned the booth that had that box. I never told them. Uh, they're no longer there, thankfully. But I never told them what happened, okay, because they would have been pissed. <laughs> and so the guy proceeded to tell me that he was putting his deceased wife's ashes in the box. And I was like, holy schmoly. He's like, she was very bohemian. And she was like unusual and had like unusual taste and really liked different things. And she would have loved this. And she was very young, he told me, and she died of cancer, breast cancer. I'll never forget her name. To this day, I will never forget her name. This had to be at least eight, nine years ago. Her name was Lolly. Well, that wasn't her real name, but her, uh, like the endearing nickname for her was Lolly. And, uh, he received the box. Now, I was scared shitless about it breaking, you know, arriving broken to him. I packed it with a lot of care. And let me tell you something. Uh, he sent me a picture of her photos. It was, it was out in the center, like a centerpiece, with all pictures surrounding her and beautiful things all surrounding her picture and her ashes. And he said, I just want to thank you so much for selling me that box. It broke my heart. It was such a cathar, a cathar, a cathar, what's the word I'm looking for? Cathartic? Uh, is that even a word? It just popped into my head. Thing. That it always remained with me. And when my own beloved mother passed away, uh, what did I do? I placed her ashes in a Moser glass casket box. Yes. And I bought myself one too. And uh, we'll show you my box. And uh, I, I'm not going to get my mother's out. It's a little sad. But uh, yeah, so that always really made me like think okay like I mean these glass pieces are so precious that someone chose one of these glass pieces to place their beloved uh, beloved one's ashes in it and so that's what got me started with collecting Moser glass and uh, you want to hear something even freakier okay so her name was Lolly and her last name was a specific last name and right after I sold that box and the guy sent me the pictures of her ashes in it and the setup. Uh, I was driving and I lived on the opposite coast. Like we're talking like New York. This person was all the way over on the West Coast. And I was driving and the car in front of me had this lady's name on the license plate. Lolly and her last name. Lolly space and her last name. I contacted the guy. I took a, a photograph of that. The car just like disappeared out of nowhere. And I sent that guy that picture. And he was like really moved and I, I was like really creeped out, but, uh, yeah. So back to the glass. All right. So that's what got me started. Now these pieces are not the most expensive of most of pieces. The most expensive of most of pieces are generally their casket boxes. Those are the ones that like everybody loves, but their big giant vases are another love. Now, what I love about it is each one of them. Even though you'll have two, two are the same, but no two are, are alike. There's always something different about each one uh, from the bubbles in the glass. And you might say, well, bubbles, oh, something just like creaked behind me. I'm a little creeped out. <laughs> um, yeah, the bubbles in the glass, you might say, oh, that, well, that's only for cheap glass. But that's actually telling us that this is older then, so from the 1920s and on, bubbles and glass really disappeared unless the glass blower wanted it to appear. You follow what I'm saying? As a design. So you know old glass from the bubbles in the glass. So here's an example of the bubbles in the glass. Do you see that? Wow, that's like a gem, isn't that? Okay, so you're knowing that this is a very old piece of glass. And it does not denote that it's cheap glass. Although... Uh, craftsmen who weren't very good at what they did sometimes uh, made mistakes like this. This is just unique, like a thumbprint. I found, okay, I found a casket box, a Moser casket box. Oh, the lighting sucks right now. Hold on, hold on. All right, so I found 
a Moser glass casket box, and it probably looks like crap because the sun is in a bad spot. There we go. There we go. And oh, my daughter just so happens to be in the room right now. So this is where I want my ashes. Uh, upon, <laughs> like, like, yeah. Come on, look at that. This is my fiery soul. Do you see the red? It's fire, and I caught on fire, by the way. <laughs> I caught on fire three times, and uh, the third time was the charm because I spent uh, a, 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 about 30-something days in the ICU, and I survived. Uh, they almost amputated my right arm. It's half gone. <laughs> it looks melted, like melted mozzarella. And uh, now it has a note in there, and I want my daughter to read it to all of us. Uh, all right, go ahead. Read the note. No, 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 no. No, so, no my name's oh. on the bottom. I don't oh, want... oh, oh. Yeah, careful. This is a rare 1880s, 1890s Bohemian Mary Gregory style painted, in parentheses enameled, Moser glass casket box in ruby red. <laughs> please place my ashes in here upon my death <laughs> and place my mother's Bohemian glass box with her ashes next to mine and that is your full name. Upon my death? Why is it so like... <laughs> upon my death? Because I have a Victorian soul. I speak like the Victorian. Okay, you're warping. With a New York accent. <laughs> I'm fucking Victorian. I'm, 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 I'm like the, the reincarnation of, of Victorian. Please place dot ashes upon my death in thine fucking box. <laughs> Look, it even has handles. You can carry me around. Put wheels on the bottom <laughs> and wheel it around like a wagon. <laughs> They're like, "Oh, what's in there?" I'm gonna be like, "My mother. <laughs> She's Victorian. I placed her here upon her death." <laughs> Look, it's got a key. You can lock me too. <laughs> I don't want anyone stealing so it. So my soul can't come out and haunt you. <laughs> I'm fucking release you. <laughs> When people piss me off, and be like, that's it. I'm releasing my mother. And then you're going to come. <laughs> but it's got symbols. Look, it's got cherubs because I'm sweet sometimes. Oh, yeah. You're so fucking Look, sweet. The uh, ibis is the, what is that a meaning of? Ibis, ibis bird. What does that symbolize? The, the Victorians, they everything meant something. It, it means flight. Okay, and the, the resurrection. The butterfly is uh, everlasting life and reincarnation. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, we have the mountains of uh, Bohemia etched in here. I'm not from Bohemia, but maybe I, I, I should be because I love Bohemian things. There we go. Do you love go. rhapsodies? <laughs> 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 That's the worst joke. It's not even funny. Look, you could take me to this little place here on the hill. That they oh, yeah, because I could in. definitely find that. Yeah, look at that. You can geolocate it. Yeah, there's a, there's a shack in a mountain. Oh, so the fuck is. well, look, there's more symbology. There's forget me not flowers. It means don't ever forget me because I'm unforgettable. And uh, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, is my note in here? Is my note still in there? Oh, I need the note. Please place this upon my fucking death. <laughs> now look at the Art ruby. Thou. Look at the ruby. Come on, look at the ruby. The ruby glass for my fiery soul. My mother's in a blue box because she was cool. Blue is a cool color. Red is fiery. Actually. Actually. <laughs> actually. <laughs> uh, the hottest flame is usually, I think it's blue. Oh, so she's even hotter than me. Mm -hmm. uh, her fiery soul was fiery. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. So now we're going to talk about the aesthetic movement. And I don't even know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Okay, so from 18, uh, about 1850, they say, but from 1860 to 1900, the aesthetic movement initiated a sweeping artistic and design change. Uh, so no longer was the stuffy Victorian style uh, approved of from the masses, especially the middle class and lower middle class. They were sick and tired of rules, rules, rules. All right, nobody likes rules. Do you like uh, the speed limit? I don't like the speed limit. The speed limit of 40 miles an hour on a residential street is too slow for me. All right? So the Victorians rebelled. And basically, the aesthetic movement was, <laughs> was born. And so they found beauty in Renaissance uh, painting, uh, Renaissance paintings, ancient Greek sculptures, East Asian art, and uh, design, especially Japanese prints. And so then we got the Japanese 
the Japanese style, which I will show you in a moment. So basically, the re uh, Victorians were rebelling against Victorian materiality and modern industrialism, which they felt were cheap, soulless, repetitive uh, objects made by machines. Okay, yes, we had the Industrial Revolution back then. We actually had machines. What? Yeah. You're gonna you're gonna bust in on my video. So then, what do you think about the aesthetic movement? So far, what have you learned? Let's see oh, if she I learned anything. Ah, oh, you it's suck. Like I just went, wah, wah. Oh, okay. Well, she wasn't paying attention. All right. So they were tired of the cheap, soulless, repetitive objects that were made by machines and mass produced. And the aesthetic movement moved forward as an art for art's sake. Like you know how they say for Pete's sake. Well, it was art for art's sake. Uh, and they divorced themselves from tradition and uh, the steel chains of rules. So now it was like creating art just to make themselves happy. All right, so here's an example of our little aesthetic movement by the cherubs that you see there in the center. It's like a Raphael. Uh, who's that artist? My daughter knows. Michelangelo and who's the other guy? Raphael. Raffaello. What? Raphael, Leonardo da Vinci. Yes, yes, yes. Like the frescoes on the church ceilings. There we go. All right. So you got that there. You got ja uh, Japonai. Japonai. And uh, what is Japonai? It's a very, very Japanese style, right? So you got the Japanese looking bird. You got the little animals. You got <laughs> My daughter's laughing. What? 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 All right. Can you show everybody that, please? <laughs> Are you okay? I think my thing is way better than that, <laughs> than a meme. Okay, all right. So here's some, so we got this this Renaissance style, Rococo, as they say. Very Rococo. And uh, did I say that right? I probably, you, some prick in the audience is probably going to correct me on my pronunciation. And here we go. Here's the Japonais. And uh, very Japanese style. Look at that beauty. Look at that glass. We got these really cool birds and um, birds. Oh, no, it's a butterfly. It's, it's got wings. I thought it was a bird. And look at that. We got the stars. We got the stars. And uh, this glass is a gorgeous aqua color. Really gorgeous. Most of these pieces are not marked. How do you know if you have Moser? Well, I can't help you out there. Uh, there was a lot of imitators. Trust me. Oh, and this one. This one happens to be badass. In the Japanese style. Here we go. Look at this. Do you see that? Very, very East Asian. And uh, this is really, really cool. And now, something I found out that I never knew before was they actually gouged this section out where this enamel work is. They actually gouged it out. Gouged the glass out and placed enamel inside holes in the glass. That is freaking amazing. Then we got the bubble which is like a fingerprint. Back in time, it's like almost like amber. Did you ever see that uh, Baltic amber where the amber caught like a mushroom or a bug inside of it? Well, this is a uh, bubble in time. Someone's breath blown into the glass as they were glass blowing. And this is their air bubble that somebody from 100 and this was probably made in about 1890s. No, 1870s, 1880s. And this is a uh, over how many years ago I suck at math? Wait, what? If this was made in the 1870s, does this make this like 150 years old? Mm. Are you going to get the calculator out, or oh, do we both like suck? Okay. Oh, so I was correct on math. Yeah. Wow. Oh, it's amazing. And again, they gouged out a hole into the glass. This is good quality crystal. This is heavy as hell, thick, and weighs a lot. Look at this. And this is like almost like a decanter or a perfume bottle. Now look at this modeled glass. Here's the back. And again, they uh, gouged out holes and then poured enamel in there. You don't get any better than this, boys and girls. And what does a perfume bottle or a decanter bottle like this sell for? Well, on eBay, really cheap. But if you had it in a really exclusive shop on First Dibs or on Ruby Lane, something like this would sell for about $500. Uh, the pair of perfume bottles back here or scent bottles that we have a pair of, which is rare. You barely ever see a pair, okay? You never really get to see two of them together. You'll find one, but I would say the pair of these between four and $600, right there, boom, okay? This little bud vase that we have right back here, uh, probably about uh, 250 to 350 to 375, depending on who is in the mood to spend a certain amount of money that day. 
Again, they're generally not marked, sometimes with just a number in enamel and beautiful. Now, this casket box is worth at least uh, $1,500 to $2,500. And uh, it's very hard to find them with the original keys. They almost always go missing. And that's where, upon my death, I am going to be placed. So thank you so much for watching. I'll see you guys all soon. I hope you learned something. If you did, uh, give me a thumbs up in the comments or a comment in the comments uh, section below just to increase my algorithm. Thanks so much for watching this video about Moser Glass. Now there's a lot of different other companies, especially uh, French companies as well, and a lot of other Bohemian companies, and German companies and European in general, like Venetian Glass as well, that did this enamel work around that time, but there's none other than Moser. Nobody can touch Moser. Moser is like the best that you can find. Um, there were cheaper pieces that came out in the 30s, 40s, 50s, uh, and they used stencils. They did not, like, freehand this stuff, and you can generally tell, and it's much lighter, crappier glass. But the heavy pieces that have weight to them and uh, the ones that have exquisite enamel work are generally Moser pieces. Oh, I just spray, uh, I, I sprayed. I sprayed. Oh, God, how embarrassing. Sorry, I hope you didn't see that. So, yeah, I get so passionate that I spit when I talk. Thanks for watching. See you guys all soon and so long.